everybody's getting to their seats, our next uh, session is exploring healthy aging over the life course. And uh, we're going to have a series of talks incorporating a, a number of sort of integrated biological and psychological approaches to understanding health and aging. Um, the first talk will be uh, a framing talk from Shelley Taylor, who comes to us from UCLA and who was recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Ooh. Her talk is entitled Stress, Social Processes, and Health Over the Life Course. Okay. Um, I think there have been a lot of exciting recent developments in stress, social processes, and health across the life course. And I want to just list a few examples. It's always risky to do that because you in invariably leave out a lot of important lines. But the first line, of course, would have to be the animal models work that has looked at some of the early experiences and their lifelong effects on behavioral outcomes as well as health-related outcomes. Michael Meany, uh, Coplin and Rosenblum's earlier work, and Steve Sumi being some of it. Uh, clinical research, looking at the long-term health effects or mental and physical health effects uh, of maltreatment, abuse, PTSD, Rachel Yehuda, Seth Pollack being some of the people in that area. Developmental research on risky families, I am modestly put us in. Uh, we study not clinically um, problematic families, but relatively normal families that are nonetheless marked by conflict or cold and non-nurturant behavior and show surprisingly some of the same kinds of lifelong effects on health indicators. And then finally, childhood SES research, uh, especially that of um, of uh, Edith Chen and Greg Miller and some of their colleagues. Now, um, the focal questions I think that these lines of research all raise is how is it that things that often happen quite early in life affect mental and physical health often quite late in life? And any of you who know the SES literature know that, that often you don't see the effects at all during <laughs> 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 during adolescence, but then they start to pop up again around the 40s and 50s. So that some, somehow the processes are being set into effect and somehow the damage is being stored in ways that achieve these long-term effects on, uh, on health outcomes. Uh, there are a number of meta-theoretical perspectives that have come up and uh, I want to mention these briefly and also say that we don't have to pick. Uh, there's support for every one of these meta-theoretical perspectives. And I'll say in advance, I think that one of the big tricks over the next couple of decades is going to be trying to fit them all together because they really make very different assumptions. And the research traditions that they've generated are really quite different right now. The first is a developmental focus on socio-emotional skills and deficits, poor emotion reg uh, regulation, low social support. Uh, several of our speakers were, are going to be speaking to this, but the notion here is that early life experiences set into effect patterns of emotion regulation uh, and the ability or not to attract social partners and, and relationships that have long-term effects. Companion models include the idea that there are physiological costs to these ineffective regulations of stress. And the allostatic load model developed by Bruce McEwen and his associates is probably the best example of this. And implicitly, this model suggests that most of the damage, or much of it anyway, is done during stressful times. But I think this is an empirical question and one that we want to continue to investigate namely whether indeed the damage is conferred primarily during stressful times or whether it sets into motion processes that accumulate on their own in the absence of stress. A third set of models um, addresses early programming critical periods as very important in getting these processes into play in ways that affect health across the lifespan. The Barker hypothesis, which focuses on nutrition, is of course one example of a prenatal effect that may have lifelong effects. 
uh, on a uh, frugal underlying biology. Um, Michael Meany's work on the HPA axis uh, emphasizes critical periods as well. A couple people, Laura, I think, alluded to the importance of critical periods in some of her comments. And then finally, I think there are more, for lack of a better term, tonic models uh, that make the assumption that um, if you have in place coping skills and regulatory skills of other kinds, that you can keep the organism on an even keel. And uh, some of uh, Sonia's work, perhaps, and, and Sarah Pressman's work also make some of these more tonic assumptions. And as I say, I don't think we have to choose among these models for guidance. I think we can put them together. And the trick will, will be in bringing both the uh, assumptions and the research traditions together. I think to achieve this kind of work or this kind of integration, we need approaches that integrate across multiple levels of analysis. And I'm going to use the rest of my time to talk about just a few examples from work on genes, neural processes uh, in the brain, and, uh, and immune functioning. Um, this is a slide that is much too hard to understand, so I'm going to tell you what it, what it shows. Greg Miller and uh, Edith Chen have been looking at social class, early life SES, and how it affects health uh, across the lifespan controlling for changes in SES. And what they find, uh, which is, I think, very exciting, is work that it almost exactly parallels the kinds of findings that Michael Meany's group show for the glucocorticoid receptor. And so we now have both an animal, beautiful animal model, and we are now showing that social status early in life shows some of the same effects. Our work has focused on the serotonin transporter gene. Uh, focus on the far left side of this slide, which is the risky allylic combination that um, uh, was alluded to earlier in Steve's talk. Um, what, we, what we have shown in, in our work is that, uh, well, it builds on work done by Caspi and his colleagues that shows that the SS, those people who are SS are disproportionately vulnerable to depression across the lifespan. What we did instead was to kind of expand out the range of outcomes that we were uh, looking at. And what we find is that it is indeed a gene that is probably responsive to the environment as opposed to a straightforward risk for depression. And so what you see here is that among the um, SS uh, group, those who came from a risky early environment marked by conflict neglect or cold non-nurturant behavior show an enhanced risk for depressive symptomatology. But those who came from highly nurturant environments actually show a reduced risk. In other words, the gene, this, this genetic combination is protective uh, in the context of a benign early environment. I want to show you this slide which is um, for the current environment, again, looking at the far left. Because I think what's interesting about this, uh, in a couple of respects, is it tends to show some malleability. It tends to suggest that if your current environment is relatively stress-free, it is also protective. So to some degree, it undermines that disadvantage that might be conferred by, the, um, by a uh, a risky early environment. OK, recently, we've moved toward looking at these, these are new data, so I haven't fully digested them yet. But recently, we've begin, begun to look at the importance of social stress for moderating effects such as these. And this slide shows uh, cortisol responses to the TRIER social stress task plotted as a function of whether you are SS, that risky allylic combination I mentioned, short, long, or long, long, which are generally thought to be less stress reactive. And these are all people under stress. And what you clearly see is that you're getting a much stronger cortisol uh, response from the short shorts, 
But if you look at the right-hand side of the picture, it says you need social stress, you need the intense social stress to, uh, of an audience in this case, to actually potentiate uh, this effect, which, which is very interesting because it might actually speak to the question of whether the damage is indeed done during stressful times, because it certainly suggests that you're getting the increase in cortisol only when people are under social stress. Recently, we've started looking at the opioid system, in part because one of my collaborators, Naomi Eisenberg, is uh, interested in um, the um, uh, uh, overlap between physical pain and social pain. And what we find is that G carriers, who are more prone to social distress than A carriers on this polymorphism in the opioid system, show this same effect that we showed with the serotonin transporter gene. Uh, namely, that you get this uh, exaggerated court response only among the G carriers, but only under conditions of social stress, again. Okay. These are some data that Greg Miller very nicely loaned to me because uh, they're, they're so exciting and they fit very much with the risky families work that we've been doing. Um, he is looking at IL-6. IL-6, as most of you know, is a pro-inflammatory cytokine and level higher heightened levels or even just low-grade inflammation can be prognostic for a broad array of disorders, including coronary heart disease and depression, among, among other outcomes. And so what Greg did was to give these um, uh, his, the people in his sample, risky families measures to assess early family environment, and then measured IL-6. And as you see, those who come from the riskier families have higher levels of IL-6, and it continues to increase, suggesting that these levels are, in some sense, feeding on themselves. But here's an interesting aspect of it. If you then look at whether people are going through um, stressful uh, events, what you find is that the, the people from risky families are only showing um, this increase in inflammatory activity when they have also been experiencing particular stressful events. So again, we're seeing this moderation of these uh, effects by um, by whether people are going through intensely stressful events or not. Uh, okay, what I wanted to do is tell you, did you say three minutes? I'll talk really fast. Um, I wanted to say a bit about the importance of using um, brain imaging techniques for trying to bring in an integrative, a truly integrative approach to, to these uh, issues. And one of the things we've done is look at the way in which people from risky families or from more normal families are regulating their responses to threat, um, stress. And we know from the behavioral literature that children from risky families are prone to avoidant coping but have exaggerated responses to stressors that are often perceived by other people to be only moderately challenging. And their coping typically doesn't uh, work well for them. And the question in this study was whether, um, whether there was neural evidence that mapped on to those characteristics of coping. We focused, not surprisingly, on the amygdala and also on the RVLPFC. Um, the participants went through three tasks, one where they observe threatening faces, one when they label the emotions, uh, and one where they, the control task where they simply mention the gender, everybody is in all conditions in, in blocks. And what we see is evidence in the brain that maps perfectly onto the coping uh, descriptions that I mentioned earlier. When all they have to do is observe the faces, offspring from harsh environments actually show lesser activity in the amygdala than those from nurturant families, suggesting that they are indeed tuning out. But when they have to label 
the emotions, in other words, have to engage in this with the stimuli, what you see instead is higher amygdala responsivity. And uh, more important, the relation between amygdala and activity in the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is actually positively correlated, suggesting that their, their frontal efforts to regulate their emotional distress is not serving them well at all. Okay, so um, implications suggest that growing up in these risky early environments actually has uh, effects that can be discerned at the neural level. Okay, um, conclusions. Uh, I um, had two goals really in my talk. The first was to raise these multiple but not mutually exclusive meta-theoretical models that can provide guidance for helping us to understand thorny problems such as these. And second, to suggest that multi-level approaches have already paid off in many respects and will continue to do so, and that integrating these psychological and biological processes across multiple levels has the greatest potential to elucidate the underlying mechanisms that will help us to understand how these experiences early in life affect mental and physical health across the lifespan. Thank you. Anybody I owe a question to who didn't get to ask it before who wants to take the first shot? Okay, floor's open for questions. Oh. There are several literatures now about the combination, you know, the interaction of genetic variation with uh, environmental factors, either affecting, you know, behavioral or, or, or neural phenotypes. One of the things that always seemed un. un Unclear is why it seems as if, as if each gene has a sort of targeted uh, uh, pathology or, or or outcome, and it's preferential <coughs> environmental moderator. So MAOA has early uh, um, abuse and it has violence as its outcome, and then you know, the the serotransporter has had life stress and and depression, but. You know, if we look at the uh, at the level of the um, amygdala or much of the neural circuitry, the genetic variations sort of across the serotonergic spectrum is having similar effects, whether they're, you know, you know 5-HP1A receptors, mm -hmm. MAOA. Um, do you think that there is specificity <coughs> of association between types of environmental moderators and particular sources of genetic variation? Yeah. Or do you think we just haven't studied enough to find whether there are common environmental diatheses that uh, should interact across a, an array of, of I th similarly I think, acting. I think that's a wonderful question. I think that's a very important question, and I don't think we yet know enough to know the answer to it. I will say that early family environment looks to us, whether you look at a study abuse or whether you simply study these more normal forms of pathology, um, it looks to us to be something that interacts with most of these risky um, alleles or, or risky combinations of genes. Um, we've seen it in three or four genes. We also have an MAOA paper that, that shows roughly that. Um, so that looks to me like it's going to be one of the common pathways. Whether there are distinctive ones, I don't know, and that, that's going to be really intriguing. One of the things we're doing right now is looking at subtypes of risky families and trying to see if the children who come from conflict-ridden families versus those who come from neglectful families versus those who come from cold, non-nurturant families show different biological profiles, which ultimately I think will lead us into the genes as well. But the ends, you know, when you, the ends are so small that uh, that's been hard to do so far. Um, but we may, you know, it may be possible, I think, to see if there are these distinctive effects. We are seeing some distinctive effects on biological outcomes. For example, the cold, non-nurturant families look to us to be the most toxic thus far, more so than even the families that scream at each other all the time. But that was a surprise. 
remember you were talking about social stress and that yes. that's a particularly important aspect. I was just wondering, I guess, whether this is specific to social stress or some of these effects are specific to social stress as opposed yeah. to other stressors. I'm not sure. I thought that they would be general stress effects. And so we designed this study, a study that has 186 people in it, so it's a fairly decent sized sample. And we had a no audience condition in the trier. We had a positive supportive audience and we had a judgmental negative audience. Now Margaret's done some work, Margaret Kemeny's done some work that has suggested that the audience is a critical factor. And we certainly found that that was the case, that the social component of, of it was important. What was interesting was it didn't matter if the audience was supportive or not. Uh, they they completely freaked out whether the audience was, you know, just there on board. Well, you know, if you've ever played the piano and been in a recital or, you know, done something in front of your family and everybody's sitting there bright-eyed waiting for you to to do well, uh, you know that an audience is an audience. It doesn't matter whether they love you or not. So, um, yeah, it looks like social stress is a an important factor here. We, that, that has to end this section. So, Shelley, thanks so much. So the next talk will be Laura Kuzanski. Um, who comes to us from Harvard School of Public Health and is going to talk to us about the biology of resilience, oxytocin, positive adaptation, and health. Okay, so it's great to be here. It's really fun to have all this discussion. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some very uh, um, recent, as in ongoing, work that I'm doing that was just recently funded, so we're really just getting up and running. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of preview about that work, but I wanted to give you some background on how I got to doing this work um, to begin with. So uh, much of the work I've done so far has focused on understanding whether and how emotions or stress um, influences both health or the development of disease. Um, and there's a fair amount of work that's been doing this with increasing uh, methodological sophistication. We're getting better answers. This is just one example of some of the work that people have done. This is data from 52 countries that looked at sort of the um, conventional risk factors for acute heart attack um, and set it up against um, psychological distress to try to see how much each contributed. And what you can see in the um, yellow dot is that um, uh, distress uh, put people at about 2.7 raised risk, uh, odds of risk for uh, an MI, which is um, after they controlled for all these other factors. And it comes up. Um, very similar to the risk of smoking, um, which is sort of interesting. And the attributable risk for this is 32.5%, which says that if you were to take away the exposure in the population, that's how much of the um, disease incidence you would be able to remove. So we've done a lot of that work. And then we were thinking about, well, if um, there seems to be this notion that there's this cumulative um, damage that happens. So if negative emotions are bad, we don't really understand yet the neurobiological mechanisms. Maybe we can get some insight if we look at more positive factors. Oh, that's just showing you the distress. So um, there's a lot more limited work looking at whether positive psychological factors can influence health. Um, but again, the evidence is beginning to gather and is suggestive. This is just an example of a study we did um, using data from a uh, nationally representative sample where we looked at something called emotional vitality. This was a um, combined measure of a sense of interest, a positive well-being, and capacity for regulating emotions. And it's sort of a classic epidemiologic study. We measured emotional vitality when people were disease-free, followed them out for about 20 years. We controlled for all the known cor coronary risk factors, including things like you know hypertension and cholesterol and physical activity and so forth. And we also controlled for distress or a, a history of psychological problems because we wanted to make sure we weren't just getting the inverse finding. We know that depression is linked to heart disease. Um, and what we found, in fact, that there was an effect about a 20% reduced risk associated with people who had higher levels of emotional vitality. And we weren't able to change that effect no matter what we controlled for, um, including the health behaviors. So this led us to thinking a little bit more about uh, how are we going to understand this work um, from a larger perspective. It looks like positive factors are more than just the absence of negative factors. Um, and and there's, it's not just about the health behaviors or something more going on, maybe stress buffering or promoting some kind of resilience. And we started thinking that the findings for positive and negative emotion may be giving us some insight into the importance of being able to regulate emotion. 
Um, now, there's not a lot of work on emotion regulation and, and disease processes in adulthood, but it kind of takes you down to thinking about some other um, new directions with maybe more of a life course perspective because we started asking the question, well, how do people get to a point in midlife where they're chronically distressed or they're chronically low positive affect? So if you take this life course perspective, there's a few things we know about emotion, which is that it's biologically basic. It emerges early in early developing parts of the brain. Learning to regulate is a major developmental task, and it has a lot of consequences for later adaptation and development. Patterns of response are shaped by social processes, and what this implies is that you could alter these patterns of response if you were able to modify the social processes around them. And we know there's a significant neurobiological component, but we don't know a lot about how that works. So this was our question. If emotional response patterns start early, they are shaped by social processes, and they have cumulative effects over the life course, whoops, going backwards, then what's the underlying neurobiology? And that's how we got to the question that that I'm working on now. Okay, so in recent um, work, probably most of you are familiar, there's been an increasing discussion about oxytocin as one of the underlying systems linking um, socio-emotional processes and health. And so we were interested in looking at this and trying to understand whether it could help inform the um, research on emotions and disease. And whether perhaps um, oxytocin is part of the neurobiological groundwork that gets laid down that links early social environment to later emotional processes and disease outcomes. So some of the interesting things we know about oxytocin from animal models, it inhibits stress-induced responsivity of the HPA axis. It is a central regulator of attachment and pro-social behavior. We know that in order for kids to learn to regulate emotion effectively, they have to have strong social bonding, effective attachment. And so the question is, can, um, can oxytocin help us to understand some of the relationships between um, uh, anxiety and stress and um, positive social relationships. So this is the model we've been working on. Positive social interactions are going to enhance oxytocin, which will then help promote effective regulation um, and therefore ultimately down the road lead to health. And we know that oxytocin is conditioned and conditionable. And we wanted to see whether some of the effects um, that were found in the animal literature fairly consistently could be translated up into the human work. There hasn't been very much work looking at humans because of a lot of methodological challenges that come along with this work, but we wanted to try to do it. So this is research we have in, process, in progress um, to do this. I'm in the School of Public Health. I've never really heard of a psychophysiology laboratory, so I'm a little bit weird now because we established a lab in the School of Public Health um, so that we could study the biological and behavioral effects of oxytocin and social support on stress response in humans. So we use an experimental methodology in a controlled laboratory setting with a placebo-controlled double-blind design where we are randomizing people to both get oxytocin or a placebo. They get either social support by virtue of bringing a friend in or they don't bring in a friend. And then we're looking across males and females because any of the work that's been done for the most part in humans, particularly experimental work, has been done only in men. And I have to say, now that I'm trying to run this experiment, I see why. <laughs> Women are very complicated with their cycles. Um, but in any case, we're going to be looking at uh, cardiovascular, neuroendocrine, and affective responses in both men and women. I'm particularly interested in the issue of gender and how this plays out. And the question is, do the effects of oxytocin look similar to social support? Do they potentiate the effects of social support? And do they vary both across um, men and women and across age? So as I said, this is very new. It's just been funded, so we've just run a few subjects. But I thought I would show you just a little bit of data as a little uh, flavor of the work. So tiny numbers, not enough to be able to do any of the factorial. This is a, a two by two by two design, so we don't have enough to do any of that. But this is just to show you initially that it looks like um, both oxytocin and social support seem to um, dampen the uh, stress response. So you can see that the folks who got uh, oxytocin or had a friend had a lower uh, uh, um, response with blood pressure. Oh, I'm sorry, I should say we put them under a tree or social stress task. That would have been good information. So they come to the lab, we administer the oxytocin or the placebo, they sit for a while while they absorb it, and then we put them under a stress task, and then we look at their affective and uh, biological responses. Then we also looked at whether there was effects on positive affect. This is particularly interesting given some of the links people have talked about with oxytocin and positive affect, and you really do see an effect so that the folks who have um, the oxytocin have much more positive affect under the um, stressful conditions, 
um, than the folks who have placebo, and the same happens with social support. The patterns are sort of interestingly similar. And then, not surprisingly, we get a very similar set of effects when you look at negative affect. Um, so unfortunately, we, we're planning to look at a lot of different parameters. We're going to be looking at um, stress-related cardiovascular phenotypes. We're going to be looking at autonomic reactivity using um, heart rate variability and uh, acute responses and anabolic balance and some of these other kinds of measures to really try to understand in depth what's going on and, you know, how much oxytocin plays a role and so forth. So I think of this as kind of a solace to society approach. The research is born out of a lot of the epidemiologic work, work we've done, the observational work, some of the sense that we're not going to solve all the questions using the observational work. We're going to have to go back to the lab, do some experimental work, and feed that back into the observational work. But the idea is to be able to link both the molecular and cellular information with higher level adaptational processes really interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying the effects of emotions, so how do they get laid down over time, and then do they set up trajectories for future outcomes? And then, as I mentioned, to translate the questions derived from population-based research into experimental studies and back again, because I think this will help us to elucidate the mechanisms, address concerns of reverse causality or spuriousness, and as I, I said in my comment earlier, issues about, you know, when do these things start, are there critical and sensitive periods, what are we going to do about reversibility? When can we reverse it? And in the event that we fail to reverse it, maybe there are some targeted interventions we could think about down the road for um, dealing with some of the issues. And then I just mostly want to say this is highly interdisciplinary work, and it couldn't be done without my interdisciplinary collaborators. I think that you know this interdisciplinary lens is going to lend a lot of richness to the work. So I've got um, collaborators, Gail Adler, who's um, at the Harvard Medical School as an endocrinologist, Jason Block is an in internal medicine, Marcus Heinrichs, who pioneered some of this experimental work with um, oxytocin, who's in um, Zurich, and Wendy is in yellow because she's here. Um, <laughs> Wendy can wave. So if you heard things that you, 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 think, you think you've read and heard papers like stress-related cardiovascular phenotypes and anabolic balance, that's all thanks to Wendy. And then there's many research assistants and study MDs. We have to have a study MD on site when we do this because we are actually administering a hormone. Um, so I can leave it there. Time for questions. How do you think ultimately the the damage or benefit will be stored? Do you I mean Bruce McEwen really lays out the notion that stress, biological stress regulatory systems are one of the chief ways in which you pick up the damage. Yeah. Do you think these positive mechanisms are also going to root through those systems by keeping the cumulative damage down, or do you think there's going to be something distinctive? Yeah. about a social support oxytocin-based mechanism. It's kind of a $64,000 question. I mean, there's sort of the two ways is, you know, it could just be stress buffering so that it provides you kind of the appropriate resources to manage the, the difficulties as they come along so that you essentially mitigate the effects of kind of the classic, you know, stress cascade. Or it could be that there's going to be something better that comes along and, you know, the, the, the the metaphor that comes to mind is physical activity, right? So you, you know, you increase your, your muscle mass and so forth. So that's not just the absence of something bad, but you're actually providing something good. So I don't have a solid answer for that yet. I have this kind of incredibly optimistic hunch that it's going to be more than just stress buffering. But if you ask me about the pathways, you know, that I have, you know, less insight onto. I mean, I think with the increasing online technologies and the ability to look at epigenetic processes and gene expression um, as we move forward, we're going to get a much better sense of what are the, what's the biology that's kind of creating this framework or this underlying kind of um, infrastructure from which people operate. But I have no doubt that that infrastructure really sets up a pathway, and it's not that you can't get off that pathway but that it may get harder and harder to get off the pathway. And so that that underlying infrastructure is really going to play an important role so that if you can understand kind of how it gets laid down, you'll have a better sense of, you know, what's going to go. But I, I, I think it's, we just don't know. I mean, when you even try to think about what are, what's positive health, and what, what are the biological mechanisms, everybody's just stumped. I actually just had a conversation with Bruce McCune about this, and he's like, mm, you know, you can think of a couple things like oxidative stress and anti, um, oxidants, but there's very few things that people yet have. But I'm confident that, you know, we've got more technology coming online that will probably help. 
We'll have to continue this discussion, I think, and hold the question for the, the discussion time, because we'll come back to this theme. Um, the next talk will be from Louise Hockley from the University of Chicago, who's going to talk to us about loneliness, cause and target. Sounds like interventions might be there. <laughs> All right, so your presentation only works on the PC, so we're going to have to use this. Oh. I'm special. Can I? Sure. Um, I'm going to start from a, a sort of a basic point. Why study loneliness? Uh, when we talked about exciting findings and coming here to share what's interesting and exciting to us, I had it reinforced to me recently why it's important. I was talking to a group of practitioners. This was uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, chaplains, hospice workers last week. And when I talked to them about loneliness and what it meant, and I will get into that a little bit more later, they almost immediately grasped and resonated with the relevance of this for their clientele, that it was something that hadn't been recognized as such because it doesn't fit into any particular DSM criteria, but we are a very social species and the fact that we can live without that um, infrastructure you were talking about uh, could have a terrific impact. Um, this is true even among medical doctors. There's a quote here, all doctors soon learn that their patients consult them far less often for specific illnesses than because they are unhappy and seek relief from their loneliness and despair. And a psychiatrist who says, I can tell you without a doubt that virtually everyone I see comes to me because of some deficiency of human contact. Indeed, I am increasingly sought out because people feel lonely, isolated, or confused at work. They feel cut off. Patients themselves, schizophrenia patients, who some would argue or would assume are indifferent to social events. This is a woman who suffers from schizophrenia. What makes value, life valuable for those of us with mental illness? Exactly what is necessary for other people. We need to feel wanted, accepted, and loved. We need support from friends and family. We need to feel a part of the human race to have friends. We need to give and receive love. But it isn't just psychiatric populations that suffer from this. This is a human condition, if you want to call it that, a universal phenomenon. And it's, it's, it has a function. And it, if you go to another population, we often assume that it's something that's particularly um, high prevalence in older people. And kind of the converse of what Laura showed us with happiness over the life course, what you're looking at here is loneliness. There's a pretty high level of loneliness in the 18 to 30 year olds and it drops to the 40 to 60 year olds, rises, rises a bit in the 61 to 79 year olds, and really doesn't top out until oldest old age, after age 80. Um, I'm a little intrigued by this in light of the plot she had because there is a, actually a superseding of the effect down here in young age, and because social relationships are so important to our happiness, um, what might be compensating for social relationships that allows people in older age to still maintain some degree of satisfaction. Um, so we have these age differences. What we saw in our um, middle-aged 50 to 60 year old population based sample in Cook County was a number of risk factors, not surprising, general population now, marital status is generally known, people who are married are protected from loneliness, but only if the marriage partner was a confidant. If the marriage partner was not a confidant, it was as good as not being married. Number of voluntary associations. So we're talking about social um, functions like PTAs or pick up basketball things that you do regularly. Um, physical health symptoms and disability, not surprising. People who are less healthy, more disabled, or perhaps having a harder time getting together with other people. Chronic work and or social stress. Also an important one because here we're talking about um, potentially identity issues and you think of the current economic situation, people losing their jobs, they're losing their sense of identity, they're gaining loneliness. Small social networks, yes it plays a role. Smaller the network, the more likely you're going to be to be lonely. Key though is how good are the relationships that you do have in protecting against loneliness. What exactly, and I'm going through this background because it's important uh, we've found in talking about loneliness to make clear that we're not talking about 
social isolation. This isn't about objective social isolation. People can have a lot of people around them that they're connecting with on a regular basis and still feel lonely. Conversely, you can get people who are living relatively isolated lives, but they're perfectly content. So it's not that. It's also not synonymous with depression or depressive symptoms because um, there's, uh, there are distinctions to be made there on theoretical and other grounds. They're definitely correlated. Um, but um, theoretically, you can say that depression is global. Loneliness is more social in its implications. You can also, on a measurement level, when we looked at factor analyses, throw in all the UCLA loneliness items, all the CESD items. You don't get any overlap except where you have a CESD item that is interpersonal in nature. I felt lonely. And the same thing was true when we looked at the Beck Depression Inventory, the same kind of breakdown. And moving right ahead. And some clinical implications that Booth lays out um, where he has some criteria that allow, can allow people to distinguish between loneliness and depression. So the how. We've talked about allostatic load a little bit. This diagonal diminishing triangle here is sort of the inverse of allostatic load. Physiological resilience, it declines with age. That's at the group level, we know it happens. But we also know there are individual differences. And our hypothesis is that loneliness is one of those factors that accelerates the rate of decline. And it can do that through a number of pathways, health behaviors, stress exposure, how one perceives and copes with stress, uh, recuperative processes. What I'm going to be focusing on with the study I want to talk about is the physiology of it. There are individual differences there. And by way of background, what we saw in young adults in TPR, which is a primary determinant of blood pressure. Lonely kids, I want to call them, had higher levels of TPR across all experimental epochs. It wasn't that they reacted differently to a speech task. They just were at higher levels constantly. We hypothesized that if that's the case, and these lonely people maintain this pattern of blood pressure regulation, middle-aged lonely people should start showing this effect in blood pressure. Young age, blood pressure levels were equal between the lonely and non-lonely. So there's some compensatory processes that allow that to happen. In older age, that might have deteriorated. And in fact, that's what we found in cross-sectional studies, that the lonely middle-aged group, 50 to 68-year-olds, had higher blood pressure than their non-lonely counterparts. But of course, that begs the question, is there a, some kind of a causal role here for loneliness? And what we've done recently is look at this from a cross-lag panel approach. Don't let this scare you. This is modeled in a way to show that loneliness has a cumulative effect. Physiology takes time to unfold. And so it's not that we expect loneliness here at year one, as two, three, four, five, this is five years, to have necessarily an effect just one year later. It's accumulating, it's building, and it's going to have its larger effects the later you go over time. And so what we see here is loneliness and blood pressure with the one-year lags. There's not an, a significant effect. If you look at what is left over, which we refer to as the trait component of loneliness, this has been around all along. What's it doing? It's predicting an increase in blood pressure in year three relative to two, in year four relative to three, in year five relative to four. So you're getting a building effect of blood pressure. And this is not on a big scale. This is 0.17, but you have to remember that annual increases in blood pressure are less than a millimeter anyway. So this is accumulating even over this brief period of time to a noticeable degree. Um, how much time have I got left? One. Okay, this is the target part that I wanted to get at because this is perhaps a little less surprising. It's not so much the physiology, but it, it also is a beg the question thing. What do we do about loneliness? And this was a surprising finding to us. We did, just did a meta-analysis. It's going out for review. Actually, it was just submitted for review. And we started out with 928 articles, ended up with 41. They got split up into 11 pre-post designs 12 non-randomized group comparison, 18 randomized group comparison, which is the ones you'd want to see. And what we expected was what the literature has tended to say so far. If you give people some group intervention, they're going to feel better. They're going to get less lonely. It kind of looked like that with pre-post, but pre-post, if you can see, that's the, the no effect line. And then the 
Scatter plots are, are mostly below that, so it looks like we're decreasing loneliness, but pre-post designs are prone to that artifact, regression to the mean. Non-randomized group comparison, again, there's a cluster that are looking like they have an effect, more around the zero point. Then you go for the gold standard, nothing, no effect. So in many ways, what this reinforces for us is that the assumption that putting people with people is going to fix the problem is not the answer, that loneliness is something different than that, and that's where we have to address our efforts. Stop. Yes. Valerie. Um, did, did I notice two that were below the, the zero line in that last meta analysis? Yeah, and was there something did. systematically different about those no, two? No, I should mention that in all of these, we did, I mean, these are not very many studies, but there was nothing systematic about those four. We looked at age composition because these range from children to elderly. We looked at gender composition. We looked at the type of intervention, whether it's technological or non technological and at uh, whether it's person level or group level intervention, nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now? Um, I was wondering if maybe loneliness is not a marker for something else, like social anxiety, and that's why you don't see when you put them with other people that it doesn't go away? Well, there's certainly anxiety involved. Why it doesn't go away, it's, it's in here. It's a perception. There's even a heritable component to it that um, people have a sense that we believe, we don't know, but what we think might be inherited there is just a sensitivity to social deprivation. So whereas some people in a big group won't feel any pain, others, that, given that same context, will feel the pain, but it's all construal. Uh, I would just comment that um, working with graduate students, it's likely that her dissertation will be on existential therapy for loneliness. And the idea being that it's not social isolation. It, they're with people all the time. It's feeling empty and even when you're around people. And the idea is to really accept the fact that it is part of the human condition. And, that, and this is, I mean, existential therapy is sort of widely discredited, but everyone uses it. I mean, I, I'm not, I really believe in it. I'm not, I'm saying from a pure You're digging a bigger hole. But, uh, but there may be a unique angle for opening up to the fact that we're all alone. And, and that, that may be what's winning here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that also your, your, what you covered with the, with the marriage not being helpful in and of itself is about right. the confidant thing. I wonder if there's a, a meta-analysis or, 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 or some other knowledge that you have related to this. How, how, how do you make people friends? How, 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 how do you bring people together and make them friends? You, you yeah. be friends, you know, because it seems to me that that's that good be, for you. Oxytocin. Oxytocin. We're yeah. all going to sit around and do some oxytocin. We'll snort oxytocin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a question that's pending now. I mean, it, we clearly need to understand how to intervene. And I think understanding what the issue is, what is loneliness, is a first step in understanding how to intervene. Clearly, just throwing people with people isn't going to do the job. And so one of the outlines that, and this is in John, John's book, Loneliness, is you, you've got to um, change how you think about your environment. So cognitive behavioral therapy is not misapplied in this case. We're going to have to stop here, but we can pick this up again at the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, our next talk is... Uh, from Dave Sabara from the University of Arizona, who's going to talk about relationship disruptions in health from, so, from social epidemiology to social psychophysiology. And if I may say, uh, plugging uh, our last year's workshop, that um, I'm hoping that the social epidemiology part might be related to something that happened at our last APS workshop. And I guess we're going to read. Yes, OK. Great. Time. Thank you. Uh, thanks for Liz and Bob for inviting me. So um, Louise actually set me up very well. Um, uh, the text here in the frame is not meant for you to read. I was going to say a little bit about this by way of bringing into relief some major points here. But ask me about these later. There's an interesting point here. The upshot of all of this is that there's social, uh, social disruptions or there's a lot, large body of literature indicating that social disruptions are associated with all kinds of broad-based health outcomes. And the, where I want to pick up today is trying to 
uh, follow up some of these uh, ideas with three studies of different measurement resolutions. And by way of measurement resolution, I'm talking about going from 40-year epidemiological studies where the effects of interest accumulate over time to uh, laboratory-based studies where the effects of interest unfold in a matter of minutes. I'm increasingly convinced that combining these in terms of our multi-level science is a great way to leverage and, and sort of integrate the unique uh, approaches of both paradigms, and that's really important. In terms of the relevance to aging research, I want to bring up two points here that have sort of been in the background a little bit today. The first is that adaptation is a developmental process that unfolds over time. Recovery is a developmental process. And to understand that, we need to understand developmental norms in midlife. Our, our child development colleagues are very good at this, and they think about uh, maladaptation as being the consequence of aberrant development. We see uh, Alan Shrove has talked about a branching tree metaphor for understanding psychopathology, where development is constrained over time by earlier branches on the tree. And this is very important for understanding um, processes in midlife that have later implications, as is the second point. The accumulation of small effects over time really matters. And Louise's, I, I mean, I didn't see her slide. But uh, so the, what she had to say here is really sort of uh, dead on about this. And I can comment more. The ultimate goal is a deeper understanding then of time-based mechanisms of action. And I can talk about this until I'm blue in the face here. But this is really what we're going to understand. And I'll, I'll hold some of this later. OK, talk about three studies today. The first is this notion that marital status is not static. And when I turned and started looking at the social epidemiology literature, one of the things they do, they being the epidemiologist, is classify people based on their current marital status. You're either single, divorced, widowed, separated, those kinds of things. But this is just not the way the world works. Marital status in midlife is actually quite fluid. And for a variety of complicated methodological reasons, doing time varying analyses with this kind of problem is not so easy. So what I tried to do was think of a conceptual solution to understanding the effects of divorce in midlife and ask the question, do changes in marital status alter the risk of early mortality? So we use data for this study from the Charleston Heart Study, which is a population or a community-based representative sample of over 2,000 adults. We have more, over 40 years of mortality data on over 1,300 of these people through the year 2000. Um, and so here's what I did. Basically classified two groups of people. The first group of people are the always divorced individuals. This represents about 25% of the adult population. They are married and then they divorce, and then they never remarry. Okay, So that's one group. Second group is the ever-divorced individuals. These are uh, adults who divorce, and then at some point, they experience a, a marital satisfaction uh, uh, disruption. They've been divorced, but they go on to remarry again. The basic difference is the always divorced group lives the majority of their adult life as a, uh, a divorced or separated adult. OK, so main findings, substantial differences in the hazard ratios predicting mortality between the always divorced group and the ever divorced group. And it looks like this. You can't really, I'm not sure if you can see these so well. Here's the hazard ratio for the always divorced group. It's a, a, a risk hazard of 1.66, which can be interpreted as the instantaneous rate of change at each successive measurement. So people in the always divorced group are 66% more likely to die than everyone else at each successive measurement period as we go out over time. In the Ever divorced group, yes. This includes both men and women. Men and women. In the other ever divorced groups, the risk hazards are at unity. So how we think about marital separation and how we conceptually solve this problem has a very big effects for a big diff makes a big difference in how we understand these effects. Okay, second study: marriage and inflammation. The ever sorry, the ever divorced groups, there is no difference in terms of the risk hazard between people who are ever divorced and all other individuals. So the effect is that unity, the lines overlap entirely. I'm sorry about that. OK, in the second study I'll talk about, I'm, I'm going for breadth rather than depth on these, obviously. <laughs> in the second study, I'm going to back this up a little bit. These papers are all available. And you know, de death is the ultimate sort of outcome variable here. But mechanistically, we, have, we, we can't get that far on it. So we'll back up a little bit and look at uh, immune parameters, C-reactive protein. And this 
follows directly from an APA workshop last year at APS. I was exposed to the NCHAP data and I basically went upstairs and started working on this. It's very interesting. So here the question is, are marital, marital disruptions associated with clinically meaningful uh, elevations in C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is immune parameter uh, synthesized in the liver, increased markedly during phagocytosis and production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Accordingly, it's a good indicator of systemic infl inflammation. There are about, there are over 50 prospective medical studies demonstrating that minor elevations in CRP increase risk for all kinds of adverse health outcomes, cerebrovascular, uh, cardiovascular events, and importantly, the PNI literature, and some people in this room have played an important role in documenting that CRP co-varies with psychological stress uh, and, and depression. So uh, there's important reasons to study this biomarker. We use data from the National so Social Life Health and Aging Project, which is the NIA-sponsored project of over 2,000 adults uh, it's a nationally represented sample of over 2,000 older adults. In this particular study, we have uh, 1,700 adults with good CRP data. Uh, mean age of the uh, people in this sample was uh, 69 years. Our basic finding here is that marital disruptions are not associated with significant elevations in um, CRP, but we get a protective effect for married men. Married men, relative to unmarried men, and married women are, show the lowest levels of CRP, and, and this effect, a 44% reduction in the likelihood of being classified in the highest risk CRP group, is using indicators that the medical literature would consider are clinically meaningful is, is a protective effect. One way to interpret this is in terms of an absolute risk reduction statistic, which is commonly used in the epidemiology literature, and I, I can tell you more about this, but the net effect here is that being a married man affords approximately the same level of protection as having a normal BMI, being a non-smoker, and being normal tensive in this, in this particular study in the end chapter. Of course, everyone who's a smoker, and I don't mean this tongue in cheek, many people who are smokers are already dead by the time this study is going on. So we have to contextualize these in an important way. Final study, very briefly, this is uh, some of the stuff we're doing in my lab at the University of Arizona. We're, now we're trying to really take a, a very close proximal look at some of how these, or some of, how some of these processes are unfolding. So among separated uh, adults, how are divorce-related thoughts associated with blood pressure reactivity? Uh, this data is, is uh, from 70 uh, participants recently separated, average age of, of 40 years old. They complete multiple lab visits over a nine-month period. And um, one of the, what we do is we bring them in, equip them with a variety of uh, autonomic measurement uh, devices, and then study them during a baseline period with in-person control tasks where they're thinking about things that are not related to their divorce and a divorce-related activation task. While they're thinking about the, the mundane events or the divorce, immediately after that, they do task appraisal items about how difficult it is to regulate your emotions and how emotionally taxing you find doing that. So we, we model the, the uh, systolic blood pressure over the course of the study, and here are the results. For SBP, systolic blood pressure, we see independent effects for self-reported emotional intrusion, hyperarousal at entry into the study, okay? So people who have high levels, this is the IES measure, people who have high IES scores, and IES is a state following divorce, decreases over three months, come in with systematically higher blood pressure, uh, increase of about six millimeter mercury for one standard deviation of on IES. Interestingly, we observe a three-way interaction for time from the mundane events to the, our divorce task. Time by sex by tread, and our tread is our task-rated emotional difficulty index. So, and in particular, men who have difficulty on the task evidence significant increases in blood pressure, whereas men who find the task not emotionally taxing evidence decreases. Women, it doesn't really matter how hard they find the task. So we're zoning in on some real uh, specific sex differences that are emerging both at the level of, both at the level of inflammation and um, in terms of uh, blood pressure regulation. In total, these effects are large, I I effectively moving someone from being normotensive up to hypertensive. I'll conclude by saying, Three exciting findings, marital status and mortality. There are large questions about social selection or causation. 
Married men are uniquely protected from clinically meaningful elevations in CRP, and our lab-based analog studies can point to potential mechanisms of action. This is really important. The study of social connectedness and health is ripe with aging-related questions. I'll just conclude by saying that from my point of view, the two real next frontiers are social relationships and cognitive decline. This is a very important area of study. Anyone who's lived this or read uh, Jonathan Franzen's work knows that this is really sort of a, an important area of study. Uh, can we improve, so, and then the second question is, can we improve health by altering relationships? And uh, Sheldon Cohn has a paper coming out in Perspectives in Psych Science asking this question, largely because everything we know about these small effects is correlation-based studies. There are very few experiments here, and this is our charge for next generation. Thank you. Question, Mara? Yeah, to connect this with the loneliness, your first finding uh, with the always divorced showing worse uh, profile than the you know, people who remarried, did you also look at people who are always single? Yes, and the effect is for always divorced over always being single and always being widowed. So something about all being always divorced. Um, uh, you know, this is really answering these sorts of questions gets me in hot water about, I'm not trying to talk about specific individuals. I can't tell you uh, if you're, you know, so, but there is a differential effect here from being always single and being always widowed. Is that, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on, but thanks very much. Too. So our next speaker is Sonia uh, Lubomirsky from UC Riverside to talk to us about uh, the promise of interventions for promoting well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was thinking that this is a perfect um, stress induction speech task, you know, with all these illustrious uh -huh. in the room. Um, so I'm not an aging researcher by any stretch of the imagination, so I'm going to use my 10 minutes to give you some examples of the work that I do, um, as opposed to focusing on one uh, finding. And I, I noticed that no one actually so far has had only three slides, so um, I don't feel bad about that. So um, I do research on happiness, on, on how, um, on whether it's possible to increase well-being over time. and to sustain it, um, and, um, and I'm really interested, I think happiness is, a, is very important for optimal functioning, and I'm very interested in applying this work to aging and across the lifespan, and I'm interested to hear your ideas and feedback, either on email or today, um, about the complexities and the concerns that might arise in applying what I do um, to aging. Um, so at the beginning of my career, I mostly uh, focused on the question of why are some people happier than others. So I, my primary approach was to compare very happy people to less happy people in the kinds of cognitive, motivational, judgmental processes and behaviors that they show. Um, and so for example, I found, I, I found lots of interesting things like happier people are less likely to compare themselves to others. Um, and so reporters would often call me, in fact mu much of the time that I spend now is is sort of talking about my work to the public, so I, it's been kind of uh, interesting transition. Um, reporters would often call me and they'd say, well, what are the implications of your findings for our readers or our listeners or our viewers? You know, um, can we tell them that they can do this to become happier? And I would always say, I don't know. You know, it depends. I mean, it's a correlational finding. Just because happy people do X doesn't mean that if we did X that we would all become happier. Um, and I also thought that was a very applied question, and I don't see myself as an applied researcher. Um, and then, but then over time, I realized that it's actually a really interesting basic science question, the question of can we increase well-being, and, and what are the mechanisms by which their well-being can be increased? So that's the question that I've turned to, um, looking at um, sort of doing what are called happiness interventions, which are basically longitudinal experimental studies. Um, that, um, uh, that follow sort of increases in happiness over time. Um, and more importantly, I'm not so interested in kind of what positive activities or strategies make people happier, although of course that's what the lay person is interested in. They just want to know kind of how to be happier. But I'm interested more in the moderators and the mediators underlying the effectiveness of various positive activities to make people happier, sort of the how and the why. That's why my, my book is um, uh, called The How of Happiness. Okay, so. Um, Ken Sheldon and David Shkadi and I uh, developed this very simple conceptual model that's actually often been misinterpreted. Um, Ken Sheldon is my primary um, collaborator on this work. And basically what we did is when we started doing this research, we were faced with a lot of 
scientific pessimism about whether it's even possible to become happier. Now, the self-help gurus who write all the books, of course, they're very optimistic that we all can become happier. But when you actually look at the evidence, um, you first look at behavioral science research, and you see that happiness or constructs related to happiness have a high heritability co coefficient. And so happiness is clearly partly genetically determined. It's part of our personality. Um, and these numbers, by the way, are just estimates, approximations from lots of studies. They're not meant to be taken seriously or set in stone. They're just, this, this model is just a way of framing the question, can we actually become happier? Um, then we're faced with the literature on life circumstances. And when you look at positive changes in people's lives, um, because of hedonic adaptation, and, and hedonic adaptation is a topic, a line of research that I'm really interested in right now. And I use the word adaptation somewhat differently from how it's been used today. Um, basically shows that people tend to adapt or get used to or take for granted almost anything positive that happens to them. So there's lots and lots of studies. Some of them are, are, are longitudinal. Some of them are short term. Um, that when you acquire new wealth or you get married or you um, have plastic surgery, at first it gives you a big boost in happiness, but then you tend to get used to it and take it for granted. And so that's one of the main reasons, I think. I think hedonic adaptation to positive experience is one of the biggest barriers to happiness. And one of the main reasons the circumstantial changes, again, when your sort of basic needs are met. I'm not talking about people who are poor and then become wealthy, but uh, sort of people like more like us, um, uh, circumstantial changes um, aren't a big factor in happiness. So they account for about 10 or 15, maybe 20% of the variance in well-being. So then that leaves sort of, again, the numbers aren't set in stone, 40% of what we call uncharted territory, sort of what accounts for individual differences in happiness. Of course, these factors interact with one another, and some of that uncharted territory is undoubtedly measurement error. Um, but we argue that, um, that a large part of what determines happiness is intentional activity, sort of what we can do, the ways that we think and the ways that we behave uh, where we have control um, uh, over our happiness, both in positive and negative directions. So as I mentioned, um, what I've been doing a lot is uh, uh, what I call happiness intervention. So testing various kinds of positive activities and testing sort of how and why are they effective, how and why do they work. And I'll just give you very quickly um, some examples of these very simple studies. Um, so for example, here's a, a, an example from a, a, an intervention where I had people count their blessings. They wrote down five things that they're grateful for. And they either did it once a week or three times a week. The control group, in this case, didn't do anything. And these are students, by the way. Um, and these are changes in well-being uh, from before to after the intervention. This was a six-week intervention. The control group is getting less happy over time because these are students and they're getting sort of more homework and stress over the course of the quarter. Um, and as you can see, that people only got happier when they counted their blessings once a week, not three times a week. That's a little bit of a puzzle we can talk about. Um, but basically, it, it shows the importance of timing as a moderator. All right, here's another intervention. In this one, we, d uh, we had people go out and do acts of kindness. And actually, I was thinking about that with the loneliness. I mean, maybe that's what people should do. They should go do acts of kindness um, as opposed to just be around people. Um, and in this case, we had people either do varied acts of kindness, so you do different things every week. This was a 10-week intervention, and they did um, either three or nine acts of kindness a week. And the red, bar, the red line follows happiness across time from before middle of study, after study, and one month follow-up. Um, and people who do a variety of kind of acts, they get happier over time, and they still remain happy a month later, which actually is, is quite amazing, because their you know, month is a long time when they haven't been doing this. Control group stays flat. Um, and then the low variety condition, these are people who are doing the same sorts of sort of acts of kindness and actually think about caregivers or people who have to do that sort of thing. They actually get less happy in the study, during the study. So again, that argues for the importance of variety um, as a moderator. Um, all right, we have some interesting cultural differences. This is a study um, um, that had people either practice uh, optimism or gratitude. And if you can see that, the gratitude is like it says thank you. Uh, control group, um, the optimism condition people kept a journal where they wrote down their dreams coming true in 10 years. Like imagine your life in 10 years and all your dreams have come true. Um, this is a six week intervention. The gratitude condition people wrote gratitude letters every week, once a week for six weeks. The control group, people just wrote down everything that they're great, I mean, sorry, they just wrote down what they did that week. We actually have had trouble coming up with neutral control um, conditions because people tend to be somewhat positive. Uh, great, actually I have lots of time. Um, so uh, we find here that overall, people who either practice gratitude or optimism um, got happier over the course of the six weeks uh, from before to after relative to the, to the control group. Now, um, in this particular study, we had, um, uh, we were interested in cross-cultural differences. We 
um, divided the subjects by Anglo-Americans and Asian-Americans. The Asian-Americans were recruited from um, uh, close-knit Asian communities in Southern California where I live. Um, and these were primarily, we did have to lump some cultures together, unfortunately, but primarily from China and almost all of them born in, in the Asian countries and very, very uh, well, uh, highly identified with their culture. If you split this finding by culture, the red bars are Asian Americans, the green bars are Anglo Americans. It's very interesting. You see that both Asian Americans and the Anglo Americans are benefiting from our intervention. So you can see either with the red, with the red bars, the Asian Americans are happier relative to the control group, um, but their the effect is much smaller. So there's something that's going on there. Uh, one of the puzzling findings. Um, the Asian Americans are putting less effort into the intervention, so maybe they're taking it less seriously. We actually originally had ideas about gratitude versus optimism, benefiting collectivists versus individualists differently, and we did not find that. Um, but interestingly, when you look at um, changes in their relationships and their sense of connectedness over time, the Asian Americans actually benefit more. So it's not like that they weren't benefiting from gr writing gratitude letters or practice optimistic thinking. And if you look at changes in gratitude, they also benefit more. So, so somehow, their relationships and their gratitude, maybe these sort of interdependent things are changing over time and improving, but not their sense of happiness. So maybe it's sort of how they define happiness and how they report it. That's sort of a puzzle. Um, and then uh, this is an example of some moderators that we're looking at. This is effort. And this comes from an eight-week intervention of optimism and gratitude, also kind of like the last study. Um, and here we find, if you look at the green bar, um, uh, it doesn't matter how much effort you put into the intervention if you're in the control group. You know, you're not going to benefit from it. But if you're in the gratitude or optimism group, the more effort you put in. This is a measure of effort from, um, I believe this was coding the actual essays that they write every week. It's very easy to see if they're really putting effort into it. So you, you, you benefit more when you put more effort into it. An obvious finding, but often we psychologists have to kind of test these findings in the lab. Um, here's some examples of mediators. I didn't want to create more slides and show all the statistics. So, um, so here's, uh, this is from another study where we also had people practice optimism and gratitude. And we found a significant and partial three mediators. Um, so why is it that practicing optimistic and grateful thinking leads people to increase more happiness over time? Um, it's because it leads people to, uh, to, have ex to experience more positive events in their lives, um, to feel more of a sense of connectedness or relatedness in their lives, and to feel more of a sense of autonomy or control over their lives. Um, um, we had measures every week. So not only do we measure well-being before and after and follow-ups. This, this study had a six months follow-up. Um, but also every week we have people sort of complete various measures. Um, so that's basically it. Um, as I said, um, you know, we've heard today, we know that people's emotional lives um, change over time. I mean, I'm sorry, differ as they age. Um, and so I'm interested in sort of how, what the implications of that are for my work, it just sounds like older people are already doing some of these things. They're already more appreciative, and maybe, I don't know if they do more acts of kindness, um, or may, they're more optimistic and positive. So um, that's it. Thank you. Alex? Um, just fascinating. I wondered if you could comment on the, the, the self-concept that might be involved here, because you're thinking about those things that allow people to sustain happiness and not just go back to the uh, set point. And if it's a self-system is somehow involved, people change in their definitions of who they think they are, that, that could carry the day for them. Uh, or maybe, th maybe there are other uh, avenues of this stability right. of happiness right. that you're... That's right. I mean, I think of it as, um, as upward spirals, right? So that, that um, these kinds of activities lead people to experience positive emotions which might affect their, as you said, their self-concept. Like the acts of kindness intervention makes people feel more, you know, like you're a good person, you're more of a generous person. Um, another, this is not really self-concept, but I think just seeing them work uh, makes people feel that, you know, I can become happier. So I think just having the experience that you can become happier um, can also lead to some, to have some kind of downstream effects. Um, but you know, these, again, these upward spirals where um, you know, lots of work on, like from Barb Fredrickson and others at Positive Emotions have all kinds of benefits um, and sort of mental, you know, intellectually and socially. And so you, you experience, a, you do an act of kindness or you, you, you write down your blessings, which makes you feel happy, which makes you feel creative, which might makes you connect with your partner, which might make you, um, some other people approach you. Um, and so you know, your relationships improve. So we're trying to have, we're trying to include these other kinds of measures is harder. We haven't had much success at kind of capturing that. So, uh, but we, we'd like to. Is Thank that it? Okay.
So while we scoop the mic up off the floor, Alyssa can be a part of it. So our, our last speaker for this session before we move to discussion is Alyssa Eppel from UCSF. And she'll talk, be talking to us about psychosocial yeah. influences on longevity biomarkers. I think so. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was just so excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I really tried to get to three slides. Um, and but I will leave five minutes for discussion. So typically um, those of you who might feel depleted from any stimulus challenge grant writing or from managing stimulus writing grants, you, uh, you would really be depressed after my typical presentation on stress and cell aging. But today I have some hopeful news. So let me start with a father of one of the founders of stress research, Hans Selye, who said uh, that every stress leaves an indelible scar and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. So where is that scar? Where is the memory of cumulative stress in the body? And what is older? What is biological aging and how can we measure it? So as psychologists interested in adaptation, it would be very helpful if we had a criterion, a, you know, an easy mark of biological age so we could see what are the adaptive, you know, most adaptive forms of coping, et cetera. So biomarkers are a huge field. Almost every parameter of biological regulation changes with age. Um, but so we really, uh, so the job of looking at meaningful biomarkers is, um, uh, is not easy. People have their favorite markers. I'm going to talk today about um, a marker of, immune, of, of cell aging, of, dividing, of the dividing cells that are important in our body that replenish tissue as we age. We need to replenish tissue for, you know, ideally a decade. So the ability to, for cells to keep dividing is crucial to healthy aging. Um, and I'm going to talk about a biomarker that I think is not just a, a, a marker of aging, but actually a mechanistically involved in aging. So telomeres are these uh, white little caps at the ends of these chromosomes. They're genetic material that protect the chromosomes. And every time these dividing cells divide, these the, the little caps, the telomeres, actually shorten over time. And when they get too short, that cell is aged. It's senescent, and it cannot divide anymore or do its job, typically. So if it's an immune cell, it can't recognize antigens, for example. Telomerase is an enzyme that prevents the telomere from shortening and promotes cell resilience. So it's, it's a really interesting enzyme we don't know that much about yet, but, it, but one of its main jobs is to protect and actually lengthen telomeres. And they can lengthen in, in vitro in a Petri dish, so can they lengthen in humans has been a question. Um, and telomere length appears to be an, an interesting psychobiomarker. And so what I mean by that is a, is a marker that's influenced by the social and psychological environment, moves with aging, and is predictive of mortality. And it looks like it's an ideal one because it is related to social status, perceptions of stress, objective exposure to, to chronic stressors, depression, and its predictive mortality. So that's kind of a list that's accumulated over the last few years. We originally studied this in caregivers, but this finding of shorter telomeres in people under severe stress has now been replicated in mice to humans. So what is the, the dogma? I, I liked Richard's comment this morning, you know, find a shaking that shakes things. Find, you know, go, do, go discover something that shakes up the, the dogma. Well, that's actually been really problematic because I haven't gotten my grant because of this finding I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> um, so the dogma out there is that telomeres shorten over time, right? It's a marker of aging, cells divide, and uh, we only go in one direction with aging. So the, if you look at cross-sectional studies of telomere length over time, these are typically in white blood cells, they do, you see a gradual decline. You see a, a big decline in the early years, which is an interesting and unexplored period, and then you see the slope that we all kind of fall off gradually. So um, this, is ba this finding is based entirely on cross-sectional studies, and recently there have been just a few uh, lo uh, longitudinal studies. So in our first longitudinal study, we looked at the MacArthur Healthy Aging Sample, and we looked at change in telomere length over two years. 
And what we found was, yes, people shorten, about 30% of people shorten over this time. They're losing their base pairs. But we also found that about 25% of people lengthen. And we got a lot of flack for that. You know, there's something wrong with your measure. We reassayed and reassayed. We got the assay down to, you know, 2 to 3% variance, which is just phenomenal. Um, and we uh, then looked in other populations to see if we keep seeing that people can lengthen in telomeres. And we find this over and over. Um, so about 20 to 30 percent of people over short periods do uh, lengthen. So does this matter? What it, who, oh, the, these people, by the way, in the red, if they're a man, they also die earlier. So losing some base pairs over a little chunk of time, two years, is predictive of mortality. So are these related to malleable factors in our, in our life, our lifestyle, our psychological state? So we did look in a current study on dementia caregiving and found that people over one year, this is a very short period, who decrease in stress actually show the lengthening. And people who uh, increase in stress are showing significantly more shortening. So it looks like it's malleable. This is exciting. We're doing several large-scale interventions um, with Margaret Kemeny, with Mandy Mendes. So please ask me about that if I do leave time for questions. Um, we're trying to modulate emotion regulation and stress to see if we can influence cell aging. Um, so I'm going to, my question for today, which I would love to discuss with so many of you who, who really have more insight to this than I, but what, what psychological responses to stress lead to the greatest wear and tear and stress arousal and in, in my model, telomere shortening um, and earlier mortality? So what are the psychological processes? So in this, um, in the... Uh, in my current studies, we're basically exposing people to lab stressors and looking at the whole stress process from appraisal uh, to coping, reactivity, and we're almost always in either kind of anticipation of stress or recovery from stress in daily life. So these are um, important, as Shelley's graph showed. People are similar at baseline. It's when you perturb the organism that you see these big differences. So Eli's been analyzing fresh data so we could show you something exciting relevant to this question. So. Um, what we're so rumination is a key factor because it keeps going long after the stressor happens. And what you can see here is during our tree of social stress, as you can see, this is just fresh output from the uh, stats program. But you can see the low bar, the low reactors there are low ruminators, the brooding negative component of rumination. At, and those high reactors are people who have higher on trait brooding. So it's predicting higher arousal. Is it also predicting decline a year later in their telomere length? You can see that it is, and actually it's a significant difference. The red bar, those are the high ruminators, and they're losing base pairs over one year. And the low ruminators are actually, on average, increasing. So I would pay anyone who would tell me the answer to this question um, about um, what psychological process I should measure with the offset from my huge battery of measures. Um, if I could just cut that down, I, I knew exactly, you know, during stress, what, we're, what we should focus on, what we should modulate. So in summary, uh, means of telomeres length can be deceiving. When you have people increasing and decreasing, you look at mean, you get no change. Longitudinal studies are really an uh, important way to go. The system's much more complex. We're finding telomerase moves up, not just down. It's like annoying like cortisol. So under chronic adverse states, it actually can be regulated either too high or too low. Um, and we really need population studies. This is a common theme today. But intensive sub-studies, so there's going to be probably 100 more uh, population studies on telomeres in the next five years, and it will be, it's linked to health behaviors, it's predictive mortality, but we really don't know what's going on. We don't know what this measure means for the immune system, so we need these smaller intensive studies to, to actually look at what's happening in the immune system. Um, and I'm going to use my last second to just plug this fantastic meeting. I would love for any of you to present there. Even though the deadline was Friday, let me know if you want to present. Um, <laughs> this is a, um, it's a very integrative meeting looking at, I, uh, we had aging, longevity as our theme this year, um, looking at interaction between psychological, um, neuroendocrine, and autonomic function and mortality. Thanks. Questions for Alyssa? Uh, Lonnie? Um, was, do you think the critical part of the stress is subjective stress or objective stress? And then also you use the term sort of increasing versus decreasing stress. Did it appear to be the level of stress overall that was important for a change in stress overall? Mm -hmm. So in, that's a good question. In, in, in general, I think that it's emotion regulation. It's what you do when you're exposed to stress, emotion regulation. So perceived stress is a really helpful measure. In, in our studies, it picks up threat stress, um, a feeling out of control and cognitive aspects of threat that tend to stimulate the adrenal pretty well. So um, in that study, we found decreases in perceived stress. We could often tie it to objective changes, like if the dementia patient is um, institutionalized, the caregiver's stress drops in a, a huge amount. Mm 
Uh, one technical, one general question. Um, I take it you, you're measuring these in leukocytes, right? Right. And under stress, you have you know shifts in the in the population of lymphocytes, right. which, for example, have diff, you right. know, different uh, uh, representations of you know adrenergic yeah. receptors and things like that. Yeah. Do you do you sort by cell type? We do. So we always do flow cytometry to look descriptively. Are there differences in the different numbers of cell types? Is it that stress is causing more? In, uh, memory cells and naive cells and really aging the immune system. We thought we'd see that those shifts. We haven't, I mean, in, at least in the two, two ongoing caregiver studies, the young um, and, the, and the older women, we haven't seen differences in cell distribution at, at baseline. We're now sorting cells and looking particularly at a uh, type of cell that increases with aging um, that we think stress is causing an increase in as well so that we can see where the damage is. Yeah. Covary across tissues. It does weekly. I, we, I, I personally think that it's immune senescence that's responsible for all the morbidity and mortality. But we are piloting follicle health cell, uh, follicle cells, buccal cells, um, and seeing if they're easy to get. You know, non-obtrusive markers that are highly correlated with blood cells. But really, I think the action is in the immune system, aging. Yeah, you know, telomerase is also one of the major mechanisms of cancer. Yes, um, and right. cancer cell growth. So do you think there's any risk in having tel um, telomere lengthening? Is that? Yeah, so that great question. Like it's really complicated. What I think is happening, what we're seeing, um, well, first of all, about cancer. So the, the uh, uh, once there is a cancer um, cell, the telomerase is upregulated to huge unnatural levels. We rule out any of those cells. Some of us, we have some of those floating around. We rule those out in our um, analyses. But the, um, uh, the telomerase field is trying to come up with a drug. They never will because of the risk of cancer. You can never really take something systemically that increases telomerase because of the risk of cancer. So we're really working on behavioral and psychological interventions for modulating cell aging. Maybe one last question if there is one. What about interventions? <laughs> yes. What about interventions? What about interventions? Thank you. <laughs> um, so I want to show you a slide from Cl that Cliff Sarin. <laughs> I cheated. OK. So Cliff Sarin. Um, uh, generously allowed me to show this. We're, uh, many people are collaborating on his project called the Shamata Project, uh, Margaret Kameny, Bob Levinson. And basically what he found is that um, he put people in a three-month intensive meditation retreat and had a control group. And so um, what he found is that post, unfortunately, we only started collaborating after he, they started, but we got a post-intervention measure on everyone. And what you can see is that the telomerase in the meditators is 30% higher than in the control group. And what was more interesting than that is simply that, well, well-being went up in the meditation group, and well-being was, was strongly correlated with the, the telomerase uh, in the meditators. They had certainly higher levels of well-being, higher levels of telomerase at the end. Um, so, so we're showing correlations between uh, psychological measures of, of well-being and telomerase, and it was the meditation that was causing the kind of high end of both. But what was particularly interesting to me is that we looked at a whole panel of biomarkers, and nothing came out. We spend all this burden getting cortisol and DHEA and BDNF and inflammation, and so telomerase appears to be sensitive to psychological factors. And let me know if you want to collaborate. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's, I really think it's a, it's a great, it should be exploited by psychologists. I think it's mostly used in population studies where we're not going to learn that much more from these cross-sectional studies. So looking at more of these lab paradigms. Thanks. Thanks. Well, why don't we um, move to the panel and get everybody around the table. Thank you, Alyssa. Also, for those of you who are wondering, Alyssa gave the shortest talk and thus had the, the largest number of questions. It was that was my goal. Let's just throw our questions up again. A reminder of our sort of three. It's not the same as the shortest tool. <laughs> it might be. I haven't measured mine yet, but now I will. Uh, now you can change. So our three goals that we'd like the panels to address are how the work that we're talking about here can advance the study of healthy and adaptive aging. What kinds of translation opportunities might there be across the three domains represented by our three panels today? One on decision making, one on uh, healthy aging, and uh, one on uh, more of a social and emotional functions and processes. And more targeted to this group specifically, uh, what are the next critical challenges in your field? Um, and I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to start addressing any one of these to, to get us launched. I think. Um, 
you know, we did start talking a little bit about the first question about adaptive and healthy aging. And there was talk in a lot of these uh, presentations about interventions um, and where they could be targeted and what's malleable and what's not. So um, perhaps that's a place to begin. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, just an, an obvious application is I would love to be able to use some of these biomarkers as variables uh, in intervention studies. And there's just so few of them. I mean, Lisa just mentioned one. Uh, I mean, the first one I always think of is Richard Davidson's study of meditation where he looked at the frontal cortical asymmetry before and after, but there's just so little of that and um, to be able to, to you know, loneliness, loneliness intervention and, and also and, and have biological measures before and after because, you know, self-report is so easy and uh, so we tend to do that a lot, but to be able to combine those two types of studies. Just one comment to that, and, and something that comes up. I was just at a mind-body health uh, session at NIH where um, the real focus on looking at the mind-body interventions was figuring out what in the body does it change, what in the body does it change, and and one of the things that we're interested, ideally, you know, we'd all like to stay healthy without disease into late life, but in fact, there are processes, and we're all likely to succumb to some disease eventually. But there are other outcomes that are of interest too, including well-being, not just happiness, but some of the other studies have measured well-being in, in other domains. And I think one of the questions would be not only, you know, what are the biomarkers and how can we better understand the mechanisms, but what are the outcomes that we'd like to see from these studies, from these interventions that we, we would consider a success? Um, and I think the, the burden of, of, the health burden of not feeling happy or not experiencing well-being is as significant potentially as that. So if anybody has ideas about, you know, what are the most important outcomes for an intervention on loneliness, you know, when would you know it was successful or for an intervention to uh, improve happiness? Brian? Well, I would just briefly, it seems like the three themes in terms of dependent variables of these sessions are happiness, health, and wealth. And, and often, I think, we don't think about wealth, economists think about wealth. Uh, but you know, wealth does matter for some things, and it might be something that's worth considering in some of these data sets. And so I'll, I'll probably make a plug for that later, but I thought I'd bring it up. It's not that valuable. It's not valuable? I hope it is. I hope this government succeeds. <laughs> just remind everybody to speak loudly so the people in the back can hear. Uh, Suzanne and then Dave and Yeah, I, I just Louise. wanted to bring up this idea of biomarkers because I think it's really one of the most difficult things to address. We see it a little bit with like telomerase, like is it good or bad? It could be either. Um, I, we see it definitely with cortisol. Like I think cortisol is the great Rorschach blot of psychotechnology. <laughs> right. If you look at a cortisol slip and really you'd be like, oh, well, morning cortisol is high and therefore that's yeah. bad, but someone else will say, no, that means you're not burned out, it's really good. Yeah. So, um, so true. The, 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 and, and I think another problem is that we are tempted to um, make inferences that are not plausible with, uh, with biomarkers, to look at cortisol or heart rate or heart rate variability and infer from that some kind of psychological state. And for most biomarkers, there are so many potential antecedents that we can't reverse engineer psychological states that way. So I think a really important direction that we can go with this research is to, do, to go from some of the stuff like Laura was talking about, like Alyssa was talking about, the epidemiological work, where we can at least say on a population level, these are some risk factors that maybe we would like to modify. Um, and, and actually, going back to cortisol, you know, not to like dump all over cortisol, but it's, <laughs> it's really confusing. I'm not sure that there is the epidemiological evidence, like blood pressure reactivity, we know is related epidemiologically to the development of cardiovascular disease later on. I'm not sure we know anything like that for cortisol reactivity. Yeah. This, this society is the home of the Trier Social Stress Test and Cortisol Salivary Sampling. Um, and so one of our sessions is on, you know, come bring all your data from your files that you haven't published on cortisol, and let's talk about what, you know, is there really a long-term indicator of chronic stress that you can measure with HP axis? And I think that uh, most of us are thinking it's been a lot of burden and not a lot of payoff. I think uh, for the diurnal slope, you know, Sandy Sefton has done some work, some work on uh, cancer survival. 
but that's cortisol slope in cancer patients. And it probably doesn't have anything to do with cortisol yeah, slope in right. five-year-olds. So. Yeah. Dave yeah, and so, Louise? So this point is very relevant. I, I was just going to, what I was going to raise is the issue of calibrated non-arbitrary outcomes. And in the medical field, calibration is a very important index. And when we look at on the health outcome side, we really have to, I mean, one way to ask it is take this data to a physician. And would they say, oh, this is really important? And, you know, we see this a lot, and it's the difference between practical and clinical significance, and, or, or, I'm sorry, practical and statistical significance. We see differences in statistical models all the time that, in, in say, um, artery thickening, that may not be of any practical difference. And so cortisol is an example of this. This is why the distinction, I think, between things that are closer to laboratory tests um, may, may be of some value here, at least in terms of understanding health outcomes. So there's a big distinction. You all think allostatic load suffers from this as much? Because that was really, I think, designed with, with more of an idea of, of linking it to things that were thought to be medically uh, significant, you know, blood pressure, hip, hip, hip waist, where to go. Right. Right. But I do think you think that's any better, or is that the same? But, link, but linking to it in a sense where you're getting preclinical levels, because you're trying to get a, a snapshot early on of sort of disease that isn't yet manifest, Well, right? I'm, I'm, I'm questioning that assumption and wondering if people feel that that's in a, in a better class than some of the, well, the cortisol. Well, that's Steve why he's laughing when you said that. He's what? Yeah. That's yeah. Steve Manic why he's chuckling. Yeah. Steve. About <laughs> that's because he's, he's, he's in, in an intervention study. <laughs> 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 that, is, I think it's an egregious circularity, uh, uh, basically. That would be but, bad, huh? <laughs> The criticism is not here. Awesome. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, one thing we tend as psychologists to do often is to think, you know, in our sort of our, our, our pre-thinking from the, from the 60s and 70s, the general sort of arousal systems or things like that. But once you start studying a disease, you find every disease has a very specific pathophysiology. You know, we talked about cortisol 30 years ago in terms of mediating psychosocial effects on, on coronary artery disease. And, you know, you can talk about it still, but there's precious little evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that, psycho that, that I'm aware of, that, that corti the psychosocially modulated cortisol is responsible for uh, any pathophysiology outside of the brain. I just, I just don't know of any evidence for that. When we look at psychosocial effects of coronary disease in, in an animal model, we find quite different sex differences, that of virtually all of the exacerbation of disease attributable to, uh, to behavioral attributes like social dominance in males uh, is, can be accounted for by sympathoadrenal activation, and you can experimentally reduce that, uh, that excess risk with a chronic administration of, of receptor antagonists. On the other hand, in, in females, it's entirely different. The, all virtually the entirety of the excess risk for, uh, for coronary artery atherosclerosis associated with social subordination is attributable to the suppression of ovarian function which deprives females of, of the, you know, ordinary and relative protection against the development of the disease. And you can, you can reverse that entirely by, uh, by chronic administration of contraceptive steroids. So you have two different, two different mechanisms by which the same psychosocial factors lead to the same disease, but a very sex-specific pathophysiology. And if we want to apply this to, to disease states and prediction of disease, I think we have to sort of default to the, to the pathophysiology of the disorder we're interested in, rather than thinking that we'll have some single marker that will have, you know, sort of pan-disease implications. But can I just follow up on what you said? So that, that all of the evidence for cortisol is linked to changes in the, the brain. I mean, so if we were interested really only in psychological well-being and not a, other specific disease uh, states, is the evidence there? In some way, uh, you want to be. Do you want to be looking there in that system? Um, you know, people who can cope with stress well and who can regulate and sort of feel states of well-being. Others may know this in the literature a lot better than I would. I would think if I was worried about memory, yeah, I would not look about look to cortisol. But I mean, there's a you know umpteen neurotransmitter systems and, and different uh, circuitries for different. You know, axes of behavior. So I bet it's. So this isn't it well chronically, and maybe Alyssa, you know this better than I do. That's a chronically mean elevated cortisol. That's not diurnal slope. That's not reactivity. That's not 
morning rise are the things that we look at 90% of the time are not the things that, that predict uh, hippocampal, loss of hippocampal volume. Is that, is that fair? Well, it's, it's definitely fair to say, you know, that elevated levels like in Cushing cause, you know, gross volume atrophy early, but we don't know, like, if those small, first of all, I think that we don't, we don't know how to measure this moving target very well. You know, with reliable measures over time, it's hugely high burden. But those little elevations at night could mean, um, over time, could add up to clinically meaningful. They don't, they don't, they look like a blip. They're easy to lose with all the behavioral confounds, these findings. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out cortisol. I'm done with, I mean, I don't, I still put it, personally I still put it in studies, but I, I don't think that we can study it easily. But if you look at, you know, what really matters for um, metabolic health over time. So insulin resistance is the pre-aging syndrome. This is cause of many chronic diseases. And you set kids up early for HPA axis dysregulation that can lead to both emotion regulation and temperament challenges and abdominal fat and you know, the Barker syndrome, the early metabolic syndrome, and that's the HPA axis dysregulation. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't rule well, it out I as a mediator. Well, as a fellow traveler, as a responsible agent. I mean, we don't have, what? we have very Say it again. Is it just a, is it a, is it a fellow traveler or is it a causal in the, in the induction of insulin resistance? I mean, I don't, the, the correlation of human population studies and even the clinical metabolic studies are not all that you know, that informative, unless we develop, you know, probably animal models where we're actually, you know, manipulating these factors, you know, their true role in the path of physiology is going to be hard to, to elucidate. And I, you know, my only point is that I think that's where it's sort of been, what, what cortisol has been, you know, sort of a default uh, culprit uh, that could be cited um, because we all would accept it. Uh, but, you know, if you look for the evidence, there isn't a whole lot. Well, we've never, and lot. has there ever been a longitudinal study where you have a, co a large enough cohort that you can follow to see if, for example, exaggerated cortisol reactivity actually means something it isn't predictive of some disease? We actually don't have that data. Yeah, so we don't even have the ep epidemiology. Nobody's ever done an experimental study where they give 486 to, a, well, no to one, an stressed animal, see if it developed heart disease. No one maintains that chronically elevated cortisol is by itself a mechanism that, can, that, that causes disease. What would typically happen uh, is that earlier on the system would lose its resiliency and you'd start to see the flat elevations. So you wouldn't necessarily get changes in cumulative cortisol, but, but if a system, of the HPA axis is losing its resiliency, there's nothing good about that. So, I mean, looking at cortisol in terms of high cortisol responses, I think is only meaningful when we're looking at young, healthy populations. When you get older, when you get older groups, you've got to look at different patterns of cortisol, I think, to have anything uh, meaningful that you would want to uh, use as a, as a predictor. Uh, cortisol is just different. I mean, say, telomeres are nice because they shorten and they get longer. I mean, court doesn't do that. Um, and and I, so I think we have to recognize the inherent qualities of the HPA axis that, that limits just volume of cortisol as, as something that's clinically meaningful. Well, can, can, I, I want to tell you, can I ask you to weigh in on this? Because yeah, I think you're probably the only MD in the uh, unless, I'm, unless I'm missing somebody, you certainly want to. But uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, maybe that's the answer to my question. To pay attention to. So the question is: Do any of these biomarkers, you know, uh, where there's there's a questionable connection to the pathophysiology of disease? We were talking about cortisol, telomere yeah. length. You know, how do you look at them? If somebody comes to you with a profile that looks like they have this kind of weird stress reactivity in these biomarkers that are, uh, you know, the kinds of things that psych health psychologists measure. What, what, are you, what are you listening out for? Do any of them really uh, alert you to and, and can capture your attention? <laughs> like I just did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I would say clinically, yeah. you know, we, we can't find use for them. I think the cortisol is a great example where, you know, there's so much variation that, that we can't explain that uh, we don't know how to use that information yet. Um, so, you know, it's not part of our clinical armamentarium right now. It's, I think the simple 
Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, I'm going to take Thanks. exercise control. We had uh, Louise and Laura, and then Margaret want to speak to this, and that, that they, they have the floor in that order. From <laughs> and this is a totally different domain. Do you want to? Well, maybe well, you on this topic, and then Margaret, and then we'll come okay. to you, and that will be our order. Okay. So I think the biomarker questions raise some really fascinating okay. questions for what we need to do with the research. Um, and I think you have to separate what you're using the biomarker for. So you could have a biomarker that's indicative of stress responsivity that may or may not have a disease pathology state related to it. You could have a biomarker that's a pre-disease marker that helps you to determine what someone's risk is. And then you could even link some of those biomarkers. So even if they're not directly linked, you could say, well, I see that you know people who have dysregulated cortisol are more likely to also have elevated C-reactive protein and other you know reduced heart rate variability and other markers. But I, I think the interesting question that comes up actually with your Alyssa's talk about the telomerase going both ways and you see it in cortisol is that we really like to think linearly and we like to think more is bad and less is good or we like to think really low is bad and more is good. But the truth is with biology it seems like it, dysregulation can happen in both directions. And the interesting thing about that is that, you know, one of the features of aging is that the, the physiological states get less and less flexible, right? So there's less variability. There's less variability with the beat to beat variability in the heart and all kinds of other systems. And I sort of thought about psychological adaptation as being more problematic when there's less variability. So that the less flexibility there is when you look at the, the positive emotion theories and stuff, a lot of it's about having additional resources and flexibility and the ability to problem solve effectively. And that the same kind of you know, reduction in flexibility that goes along with the biological systems may also be a feature of poor psychological adaptation. But it does require kind of this ability to think more you know, more in terms of variability and dysregulation and, you know, the problem is we don't know what normal is for a lot of these systems. So until we figure out kind of what's normal, what's good, then we can figure out, oh, well, if you're this many standard deviations above or below, either in the physiological domain or in the psychological domain, then I have a sense of what I'm worried about. So PTSD is a classic, right, where you have, you know, dysregulated cortisol, but often it's blunted response and that seems to be bad too. So I think if we, I think that one of the next kind of major frontiers is going to be to try to think more complexly about both the you know flexibility and variability in the various systems, and actually they might inform each other. They may not be all that different. Margaret. So yeah, just in the in the service of not throwing out the HPA, um, I do think that we one we really don't know when you perturb that system whether that perturbation is predictive of disease. I mean that's already been said, and I think that's a really important. It's a way of capturing perturbation. But even more important to me in our research anyway is you know we know that the inflammatory system is really important in the body. We know that dysregulation of inflammation can lead to mortality, can lead to all kinds of inflammatory diseases. Glucocorticoids play a very important role in constraining inflammation. So one place to look is not only at glucocorticoid regulation of inflammation, but at the receptor, the expression of those receptors on the cells that produce the inflammatory molecules. And glucocorticoid um, responsivity um, uh, resistance in those cells is a really important outcome that can be measured. So you're not just looking at this, the HPA by itself, you're looking at the expression of the receptors for the HPA, for cortisol, and whether or not they're there. Because when they're not, those monocytes, those cells that, ex that release uh, the inflammatory mediators, don't get constrained. So the HPA, I think, is really important biologically. It's just that I think we have to look at it in a more sophisticated way, particularly in conjunction with inflammation. So we found that the Trier social stress test, for example, increases glucocorticoid resistance. The ability, those, cell, those receptors downregulate, and then you get this inflammatory milieu in the body. So I don't throw it out for that um, reason. And I just want to segue from that into, I think we need the same kind of specificity and sophistication on the psychological level that we're talking about on the biological level. Some of the reasons we don't see things is we throw all these self-report measures at a bunch of people and we, we they have all this overlap because there's self-report, you know, there's all these individual difference factors that influence how we fill out questionnaires. And I was really happy to hear these early talks 
using these emotion regulation tasks and looking at emotion faces, that's almost never done in this area of looking at stress and its effects on the immune system, for example, and inflammation and cortisol. We don't use tasks that I think might actually really link up to these biological systems because they're capturing something real. They're really capturing people's emotional reactivity in these various contexts. So I'd really argue for trying to bridge across those early talks into the biology by using some of those measures that seem to be really important. So. I just wanted to make a more considered response. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I guess the other side of the coin is, is how high the bar has to be set for a clinician to use a biomarker. So if somebody brought up ApoE4, it's a great example. It's a very powerful biomarker. If somebody has a mild set of cognitive complaints and they have an ApoE4, the chances that they have Alzheimer's disease developing already is very high and it's very predictable. And most clinicians probably rightly don't get ApoE4s in patients with these complaints. And it's because the intervention isn't there so that we know what to do with the result. And so as far as the science advances in identifying these biomarkers, I think clinicians will understandably be reticent to use them until we know what to say as the next step. So it sort of shows you how important the, the intervention parts of the studies are. And Louise? I think I'll reserve my right sex. Something totally different. So yeah. the time, let's just let it go. No, no go ahead. Really? Uh, we're coming very, very close to lunch. So. The people are hungry. They're starting to think, ooh, we're five minutes over. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. go for it. Okay. So uh, something that stimulates the appetite and the mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Um, I also made the connection with the earlier talks, uh, in my mind, thinking about timing, the importance of critical periods, starting early in life, especially with biology, physiology. Who knows what you're born with that predisposes you down a certain trajectory, and if you're going to intervene where, where the interventions happen. Also a plug for society. Also a plug for society. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that there are, there's a role for society in permitting and inhibiting the kinds of changes we might like to see. I think of this in particular with loneliness. Um, you might have heard of Nick Christakis' work with the contagion of obesity, the contagion of happiness. Well, he just did a, a, a study with John. Loneliness is contagious. Not only is it contagious, what happens is people push the lonely people to the periphery of society. And it may be adapted. We don't want to be infected by what they've got. But on the other hand, how are we going to uh, allow for those people to have the potential to connect if we don't offer some permission, some way of pulling them in? And then thinking of, of Son, of, uh, of the work with the happiness and the gratitude and so on, the individual level intervention could be useful, but I think it's nice to think of it in terms of getting out of your head and into somebody else's uh, benefit, and I'm thinking here of uh, volunteering. I'm thinking of Linda Freed or Fried, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Freed. Experience, Experience Corps, where you have elderly people matched with young children, and the benefits are both ways. And what's really potent about it is the relationships they form. And it wasn't that relationships was the point of it, but that's what actually gives it its meat. And it's a safe entry for people who don't feel like they have a safe entry into connections any other way. Just to, for those who don't know, Experience Corps has uh, seniors in Baltimore volunteering in the public schools to help children with their reading and so forth. And yeah. Branches around the country, actually. There's yeah. one in Chicago, I know. So, so, um, so we're going to thank this panel. It's great. Thank you. Thank you.